Hello again, everybody. Well, today on a very early morning, we're over at the Craven's house. We're going to be working with a park ranger and we are going to be checking out Lookout Mountain Roads and Rails. It's a little ranger guided little hike up and down the mountain. We're gonna check out some fun stuff today. So let's have some fun today in a beautiful cloud wrapped and fog wrapped day. Um, if you have an issue of any kind, uh, if you'll let me know, um, or um, Greg, Greg, will you wave? This is Greg. He is one of our volunteers. There's perhaps uh, nobody here in the Chattanooga region who knows the trails of Lookout Mountain uh, better than Greg Grant. Um, so he's going to kind of be bringing up the just a minute. We're going to go up what's called uh, the Hardy Trail. Uh, then we're going to make kind of a hard switch back. Uh, if you've ever ridden up Scenic Highway where you see that big giant boulder that's just kind of inexplicably sitting on the side of the road, kind of right next to that is a, where the trail turns back up. Uh, we'll go up the mountain just towards, uh, we'll end on what's called the Mountain Beautiful Trail. We'll end up, it's kind of just beneath Point Park uh, at the site of what's uh, called the Old Point Hotel. Uh, and then we'll kind of swing back down the Craven's House Trail. Um, this is certainly one of the more iconic places here in the city of Chattanooga. Um, if you go to, if you're planning a trip to Chattanooga, which I think, I've, I mean, a lot of familiar faces here, so I think a lot of you guys are locals, but, um, but if you're planning a trip to Chattanooga and you kind of Google things to do, places to see in Chattanooga, Craven's House usually pops up. Well, Craven's House is a kind of a, a, one of my favorite kind of places here in the park uh, because it, it allows us to tell a relatively complex story about life here on Lookout Mountain. Uh, Robert Cravens was a uh, local iron master, which is just a great job title. Like that just sounds way cooler than like park <laughs> ranger or accountant or anything like that. Iron master. I mean, it feels like you're some kind of a superhero or something. They should have a movie about him. Um, so uh, he's local iron master. Uh, runs an iron foundry that's uh, located at the one. The main one down here is uh, we can actually still see the ruins of at the uh, base of uh, the Hunter Art Museum there, uh, where the big bluffs are. It's um, called the Bluff Furnace. Um, and so that's kind of how Robert Cravens made his money. Um, he had a home in the city, and then in the mid-1850s, like many people today, he kept looking up at this mountain and going, I bet it's not as hot up there. That looks pretty nice. And so in the mid-1850s, he comes up here and he builds a home uh, that is known as, that he kind of calls Alta Vista. And that's kind of one of those neat nuggets that a lot of people don't realize that it had a fancy, uh, fancy name. Um, and we do have a cool account uh, from a minister who stayed, spent some time here in the summer of 1857. Um, and so uh, this young, uh, this minister's uh, name was Reverend Sullins. Reverend Sullins uh, writes in the summer of 1857 of his trip here to the Craven's house. He called it all to Vista. He said, it was delightful, but it's the poorest place ever tried for reading and making sermons. <laughs> if you've ever been up here when it's not foggy, you can see why. He says, there's too many things to look at. That long sweep of the river around Moccasin Bend, the numerous railroads with the snaky looking tr training, uh, trains running in and out of the foot of the mountain, the town huddled up at the foot of Cameron Hill, the mountains stretching for many miles on all sides, the old Cumberland, he's talking about the Cumberland Plateau on the north and west, heaved like a troubled sea, stretching far away to the Kentucky line, to the south and east, the Great Smokies piled all the way back up to the Blue Ridge. The landscape all around is covered with farms, uh, and from yonder cottage, who's kind of looking down, and you can see like farmhouses down beneath him here. And from yonder cottage, the blue smoke curling upward, which says dinner's getting here for husband, who's plowing that field over there. And way off yonder, a cloud carrying a ship's load uh, of water to the farmer's fields. All this and a thousand other grand and beautiful things invite and feast your eyes until you look down into the cottage, talking about Alta Vista, and Sister Cravens has hung the towel out on the railing over the back porch. Dinner is ready, and nothing is done on the bluff. Now, one of my favorite places about the Craven's House, though, allows us a glimpse into a, uh, into a little darker uh, or more <coughs> troubling past uh, here of life here at the Craven's House. The Craven's House itself was destroyed over the course of the war, which you kind of see a picture of what it looked like uh, there when it was destroyed over the course of the war in 1863 and into 1864. But one structure remained, and if you look in that picture over to the right, you can see a little stone outbuilding. That's that right there. Some people call it the kitchen. Some, what Jesse Cravens, Robert Cravens' son, called it was the dairy. And he tells us um, in the summer of 1861, he says, or summer and fall, he says, my father, talking about Robert Cravens, told Dan, basically is this old Irish laborer who's living in town, he says, go to the mountain and stay there until he came home and to keep his mouth shut. The following morning, 
father turned over a stout negro to old Dan and put him to building the stone dairy, which they were more than a year in completing. Took a while to build that. But that structure that's right behind us is one of the few structures that remains here in Hamilton County that predates the Civil War. And it's one of the few structures that we can positively say, based on this account from Jesse Craven, that, slave, that enslaved people built. So that stone is kind of touching that bit of past. Often we visit the Craven's house and we talk about life on the mountain. You know, it's kind of this life of luxury. We think about the Whiteside family living up near the point. We think about the Cravens out here. But for a lot of the people that live here, this is a place of hard work. This is a place of labor. The Cravens family enslaved 12 people at the out by the outbreak of the Civil War. And at least one of them helped build that dairy that still stands today. I know Rock City does a really Well, there's kind of two ways people have gotten up here historically. The first is via a series of roads, which, if you look at your little packet there, on the very back, kind of top right corner there, uh, there's a copy of a, uh, of a lithograph um, that was uh, done. Uh, that lithograph is actually, you can download that off the Library of Congress website, but you've got to see the road that kind of winds up the mountain. And so people, the way people drive up the mountain today is not all that different from how people got up here in the 1850s and into the 1860s. At the top of the mountain in the 1850s was a small community called Summertown, um, which is kind of what it sounds like. It's sort of a weekend home, a uh, weekend getaway for some of the people that live uh, in the Chattanooga area. Um, but moving into the 1880s, 1890s, you certainly still have the roads, but train lines become a, a popular means of uh, transporta transportation up and down the mountain. And so with that, if you will flip and look at your map there that's on the inside cover there, it's a little historic map that's there. I can show you on this map right where we are. If you kind of find where it says the Point Hotel, which is where we're going in just a few minutes, and you follow the Incline Railroad down, where it intersects with what's called the Broad Gauge, the Chattanooga Lookout Railroad, where those two lines intersect, that's where we're standing right now. We're actually standing right now on the rail bed of what's kind of locally was called the Broad Gauge. Kind of the official name was the Chattanooga Lookout Railroad. This was a train that went all the way from kind of down in St. Elmo, swung all the way around, comes all the way around the mountain. Um, to take you out to uh, eventually um, towards what's uh, called the uh, the Point Hotel. <laughs> uh, real quick, so one of the things we've been kind of talking a little bit about and we'll continue to talk about is the idea of life on Lookout Mountain, kind of people living here. But in a sense, the mountain is kind of a living thing as well, although it's living on a totally different scale than we are. You and I, we're living in, in terms of decades. I mean, like, if we're doing really good, we got maybe 10 or 11 decades in us, and that's like, we're living old enough to make the news, you're so old. <laughs> Most of us, realistically, we've got like seven, seven to nine decades in us. The mountain, though, is living in a scale of millions of years. But periodically, things happen in a matter of moments where we can kind of see that mountain's life changing a little bit. I was going to just say four or five years ago, but while we were walking and chatting about it, somebody looked up the exact date. On New Year's Eve, 2012, going into 2013, this lovely little nugget right here used to be up top. Oh, cool. And on that night, uh, New Year's Eve, uh, it decided it didn't want to be up top anymore. And it took a little tumble down here. Um, one of the residents that lived up there, um, actually, they heard the sound and they actually called the FAA to report that a plane had just crashed into the mountains. Jeez. That's how loud it was. Um, and when you look at this, you go, wow, I can imagine just how loud that might have been. I can't imagine it, but it's easy to kind of think we might could. But it tumbled down from the top and thankfully came to a rest here on our trail. And it did not kind of make one more turnover and end up blocked in the middle of Scenic Highway. And then from there, taking another turn over and tumbling on down into St. Elmo and, and everybody's houses. It's kind of the ground kind of peels, away, peels back away from what we call the palisades of the mountain. 
uh, kind of the general structure of Lookout Mountain is almost kind of think of it as kind of a vertical rock that's kind of like this, and then it's kind of got dirt that kind of pulls away like that. If you were kind of thinking of it that from a side cutaway, so over time, you know, it's going to kind of drift down. But periodically, we do get to see things in the life of the mountain in the form of this big boulder. Um, we're going to cross our fingers that another one doesn't decide to pay us a visit right here. Um, so, uh, and again, as somebody shared with us just a few moments ago, uh, since this thing fell on New Year's Eve 2012, uh, the, the joke is, I guess, that, that here in Chattanooga we drop boulders on New Year's Eve and not a, not a big light-up ball or anything. So today, all that water seeps into the mountain, kind of slowly eats away at the limestone, opens up a series of caves, the most famous of which is one that probably most of us here have been in before, uh, the cave where Ruby Falls is. Um, this mountain is pockmarked with caves. Uh, and, it, cause it, and those caves are constantly changing because, again, this mountain is kind of a living thing. And so the sides of the mountain are covered in seep springs. Very kind of early in the, the, the residency of uh, white Americans on Lookout Mountain into the 1850s a little bit, uh, several of these seep springs were kind of modernized. And what we're gathered at is kind of the ruins of one of those. Um, according to kind of tradition, this opening right here would basically stay full and actually kind of flow out even. And they would have a bucket up top that would come down and loop back up and that's how they get their water up and down the mountain uh, and this is like 1850s 1860s um, there's a couple of dozen of these springs uh, through here um, I'm about 99% sure this is the one called Leonora Springs um, but uh, there's numerous of these springs that still exist and even today I mean, as we kind of look back there you can still kind of see just a little bit of water still flowing not enough for you to run your bucket up in just a minute, we'll see how we get water up there now. Way up um, there to know that, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, well, a lot of... It looks sort of, manufactured yeah. around the entrance. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely kind of a, a man-made opening here. Mm -hmm. Now, how they made it, whether they stacked rocks, whether they came in and cut, whether they drilled, I don't know that. I don't know that. But again, one of our kind of cool features here on the mountain that most people either don't know about, or if they do know about it, they, they are, or they either don't know about it, or they don't ever walk on this side of the mountain or see it. So, anyway, Leonore Springs. Uh, pretty cool. Um, and that kind of brings us to, to kind of right here as well. These two spots kind of go together in my brain a little bit. Um, so we talked about, you know, what do people need to live on this mountain? Food, water, shelter, clothing. Well, for people living on top of the mountain in the Summertown community in the 1850s and 60s, and really even into the modern era, the way you get materials to build shelter is going to be via the roads. Or, you know, if you're in the 1890s or very early 1900s, the rail lines coming through here. But, white Americans in the 1850s are not the first people to live on this mountain. This is... The fir this area, rather, is kind of in the heart of the Cherokee Nation. Right. And even going way before the Cherokee, I mean, there's all sorts of other groups that go back uh, even way before the Cherokee. And a, and a lot of the trails and roads that we have here in the Chattanooga area today actually kind of have their start as kind of trade routes that existed uh, some of hundreds of years um, going back. Good. A little bit of a slide. Now, for you folks that know the area, this is the two main water lines that come up Lookout Mountain to supply the big water towers going up on the mountain. Um, on Lookout Mountain, kind of between Walker and Dade County uh, on the Georgia side and then here on the Hamilton County side uh, in Tennessee. 
um, kind of the two communities combined, uh, make up a little more than 5,000 people that are permanent residents here on the mountain, as well as a number of uh, businesses, uh, tourist type ventures, that kind of stuff. Well, they still have the same problem that people had uh, in the 1850s, and that is how in the world to get water to them. Today, we utilize things like pipes, like these. This is how the water comes up. The pipes like this are how the water comes up, how the sewage goes down. Um, and so it's a little more efficient than our bucket system that the Whiteside family who lived on top of Lookout Mountain uh, would have been using in the 1850. These are the old pipe buckles for the smaller eight inch. Uh, oh. Look at the cables. Oh yeah, it's not close. <laughs> oh, that it's just right makes about, it. It's right about the crossover now, because that's, yep. you know, that's that's how, about halfway where the other one's not up high enough to counterweight it. We're crossing the incline again. Uh, and so real quick, so one of the questions people ask sometimes, why in the world are there incline railroads here? Well, the incline railroads exist here because of two hotels that, ex that were here. Uh, we're going to be going to the spot of one of those hotels here in just a few minutes. That's just for you there. Um, we're going to get out to the point of one of the hotels. Uh, the Point Hotel was built in the 1880s, and they built a train to get up to it. We've kind of alternately been on some of, some of the trails we've been on. have actually been on some of them. Now, the purpose of that hotel was because a lady named Harriet Whiteside owned what is now Point Park. So, if you wanted the view from Point Park, you had to pay her. Well, some competitors built a hotel out at the Point, and to get their customers there, they built a train. Well, Harriet Whiteside, she built a hotel. They'd already kind of had one a little bit before the war, but they built another hotel that's located basically at the top of this Incline Railroad, right near the present-day Incline Railroad station today. And in order to kind of win the train wars, she built her own train, and that's the one that's here. And so for a little while, we do have two competing Incline Railroads to get you to the hotel. Now, why is this one still here and the other one's little more than, rail, than, a, than a hiking trail? Well, this white side, she was getting on up there, and so she decided she was going to retire, I guess we'll call it. And so she sold her property, what is now Point Park, to the government to add to, a, to the new National Military Park, Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park. But once she did that, that kind of put the hotel out on the point out of business because now you can just go up there and go to the government park without having to pay to go into their hotel. So that put them out of business, but her hotel continued on with the Incline Railroad here. And we can all wave at the people now. And now they're all very confused, like, what's going on? And so this incline has been in operation since the 1890s, uh, continuously. And today it's uh, one of the more popular tourist attractions in the area. Runs about a mile, uh, takes about 15 minutes or so to do it. And it takes you to today, the Incline Railroad Station, and then you can walk down to Point Park. Yay! Except there's always that one person that doesn't like going downhill. So, oh, now she's like, oh, no. It's okay, though. I hate uphill, but that's just me. So, um, real quick, uh, what we're going to kind of do, we've kind of got just two more little stops we're going to make here on the hike. Um, and, and what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, kind of the, the, the sort of life on this mountain. That is kind of why this place exists as a park. So Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park was created in, the, uh, in August of 1890. Uh, and it was created by Congress to preserve a Civil War battlefield. And that's hard for us to envision right here, but we are on a battlefield. If you were standing right here on November 24th, 1863, it would have looked a lot like this. Cloudy, overcast, they called it the Battle Above the Clouds. And the Union position went from basically at the point right here, underneath the, the bluffs. You gotta see the monument embedded in the rock right here. And it went kind of all the way down. Um, and they kind of swung around. In just a few minutes, we'll talk more about the battle. Um, and we'll kind of actually be following those Union troops' advance as, they head to, as we head back towards the Craven's House. Um, but what I really want to kind of talk about here, though, is kind of one of the more iconic things that was ever built on Lookout Mountain. Um, some people, not everybody that, that lived on Lookout or lives on Lookout is a permanent resident. Um, again, there were two hotels that were up here uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, and we are standing uh, basically inside what was called the Point Hotel. Oh. So if you can imagine, the trail you're on is essentially 
kind of sort of the train tracks that got you into it. And if you kind of look down off that ledge right there, don't, don't let go falling off the ledge, there's kind of another little flat plateau just a few feet down there. There was a massive, massive, massive hotel. There's actually a picture of that in that little packet I gave you guys. Um, if you still have those and they have it completely disintegrated with water and sweat. Um, there's a, there's a picture of that. I believe it's on the back. Um, mm -hmm. you can see it there. Um, so, uh, it's huge, 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 huge hotel. Um, very much a luxury place. Um, and this hotel existed. It went kind of from this plateau right down beneath you and it went all the way up to even with the point. We are right underneath point park right here. So all those famous pictures you see of guys hanging off the rocks. This is it right here. So that, but the point, but the hotel went up to just beneath the point. And in many of the photographs taken in the early 1900s of the point, you see the roof of the hotel sitting there, kind of blocked their view a little bit. But the reason this hotel was built was in trees. order to basically give people the view overlooking the city that unfortunately we don't have right now because of the, the, the fog, but to give you that view overlooking the city without having to pay Miss Harriet Whiteside who owned what is now <laughs> Point Park. Uh, it basically was driven out of business. Um, a lot of times you'll see stories that say it burns down. Um, that's typically a mix up, a mixing up of stories. Uh, the other hotel that was over by the Incline Railroad Station, it burned down. This one is basically just goes out of business and is kind of just slowly just taken apart. Um, bit by bit, really all that remains of that of this hotel is supposedly that concrete slab right there is part of kind of the foundation uh, materials kind of from it, from, from a supporting pylon. And then kind of where you see some of these steps that come up in, and then like some of these monuments were kind of intended to be sort of decorative uh, around, the, around the back of the hotel here. But if you can kind of imagine, we're standing in the back of a hotel that would have jutted out way out off the point of the mountain. And if you're looking at it in that picture, you can see just how far it jutted off. Um, and so kind of the moral of this story, when we think about life on Lookout Mountain, it's, to me, this hotel is always a reminder that life is, I don't mean to get too philosophical here, but life is always a little bit fleeting. This mountain reclaimed that hotel at some point. At some point, maybe in another couple of thousand years, when our civilization is gone, this mountain's going to reclaim our, our stuff. You know, the, 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 maybe somebody will be giving a tour up here in 5,000 years, and they'll be standing at the stone-like remnants of the New York Monument up there. And like, we don't know what this was. It was some religious, <laughs> some religious ceremony. I don't know. So, again... This to me is, is one of the neatest places here on Lookout Mountain because it's a place where we can look out and we see what feels like something that's just totally natural, but it's not. Good year for moss. Yes, it's <laughs> like in Especially in the spring. Days. At least it's not on fire, right? Yeah. Either see so the, so there's a couple of you guys may have noticed that like kind of into the sides of the trails like rocks that look like they've been, been intentionally stacked there. Right. Those are usually from one of two er, eras time periods, um, and it kind of depends on on which one you're looking at. Um, some of those are CCC Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s. Uh, and so this is a great little kind of addition to our life on lookout story here. Um, in the 1930s. Uh, there were young men who lived here on Lookout Mountain, uh, down the slopes, actually kind of down beneath us here a little ways, uh, in, a, way, in a Civilian Conservation Corps camp called Camp Demaray. Um, if you're ever actually hiking out on one of the truck trails, you can actually see the ruins of the camp are still down there, which is really cool. Um, and so one of the projects that they did uh, in parks all across the country was building trails, planting trees, that kind of stuff. Well here, it's building trails. And in a lot of cases, that means stabilizing uh, kind of the banks here so that, the, so that it doesn't uh, collapse. And so when you see like those rocks stuffed in underneath, uh, or like the, 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 the looks like they've been built into a wall, sometimes that's CCC. Sometimes that is also though, it kind of depends on the time period, uh, footings from, uh, from the train eras. So like when they're building the train, sometimes you'll see uh, those walls are kind of put in to keep the, uh, the trail in place because the trail used to be a rail bed. Or they're trying to like say, keep a section from tumbling down on top of the train. <laughs> this park was created in the year 1890 though for a specific purpose. If you read the enabling legislation that creates this park, the purpose of this park was to kind of preserve the areas where 
1863, armies fought over control of the city of Chattanooga. I mean, that's kind of in the legislation. That's why we exist. Now, we still get to talk about these other things, the trains, the inclines, the CCC, you know, kind of how these springs and stuff and shelter overhangs uh, kind of help facilitate life on the mountain. But at the end of the day, our core story, the core thing that we, we are, are focused on is the battle that took place here. In November of 1863, the city of Chattanooga had been under siege for some time. The Union Army was trapped out in the city uh, in kind of a defensive line that strung kind of basically around kind of downtown. Uh, we still see some of the remnants of that today uh, through the names of some things. The Confederates circled the city and they, they used Lookout Mountain and the point of Lookout Mountain as an observation point and also to try to choke off the Union Army supply route. Well, in late October of 1863, Union forces came out into Lookout Valley, back behind us here, down near Wahatchee, uh, basically where the Walmart is in Lookout Valley. Um, and their kind of mission was to start to try to open up a secondary supply route. There's a small fight that takes place out at Brown's Ferry, uh, where Union forces load up on boats and float around the float around on the float around the river on. Mo uh, I can't talk today. Float around Moccasin Bend on the river uh, and and kind of capture that and start moving in to try to link up and create a supply uh, line out behind us here. And that's ultimately successful, but the Union forces stay out in Lookout Valley until the end of November. When on November 24th, they're given orders to attack the Confederate line on Lookout Mountain. And what they do is just a little ways to our south, to, to y'all's left, my right here. Um, Union troops kind of take their line and they swing it all the way up and plant their right flank, the right end of their line, kind of right at the bluffs, which we can kind of see this bluff back behind you guys. They call it the Palisades. The left end of their line is pretty much all the way down just about to the creek. And so what they've done is, I mean, you kind of see how steep this is. They're literally in a line that kind of does this. And their objective is to attack the Confederates wow. who are positioned around Craven's house. So they aren't charging straight up the mountain like this. Rather, they're in a line kind of going from that bluff all the way down this way, and they're going to go that way. So as we go back towards Craven's house, we are literally following in the footsteps of the men of specifically the United States Army's 12th Corps, um, particularly uh, some New Yorkers, some Pennsylvanians, uh, who, as they began their assault um, on the Craven's House. And even as we approach the Craven's House, if you take your little packets out there, um, as we get close to the Craven's House, there's actually a picture that was drawn uh, kind of showing that fight from the very angle that will be coming out um, on, on, the, uh, on the house there. So again, as, we're, as we kind of finish up this hike, you know, a big part of life on lookout here is that some of these people lost life on lookout. I mean, this is a battle. People fought here. Um, ultimately, the United States Army was victorious here. They defeated the Confederates. Um, this battle was meant to be just kind of a diversion. Um, and they drove the Confederates off of lookout. The next day, they drove the Confederates off of Missionary Ridge. And ultimately, uh, U.S. victory here in Chattanooga led to victory in the Civil War um, and the defeat of the Confederate uh, experiment, the Confederate government. Um, and so this kind of last little half mile, six tenths of a mile segment we're going to be on here. Um, we're going to be following in the footsteps uh, of some of these men. And as we're walking this, I want to share with you guys just a very, just kind of a one-liner. And some of you guys, if you've seen me uh, do one of my tours up at Point Park, you've heard me even recite this. But one of the, the Union soldiers who makes this attack is a young man named Ambrose Hayward. And we're kind of in his footsteps. Um, and and as, in a few days after the battle, he wrote to his dad, he said, uh, come and see Lookout Mountain or you'll never know what wonderful deeds the American soldiers have done. And so you guys say we're not only coming to see Lookout Mountain, we're going to follow in that route that Ambrose Hayward uh, made. So again, a big part of life on Lookout is that this is a place where people struggled for life on Lookout. Um, Ambrose Hayward uh, ended up being killed, uh, <coughs> it was mortally wounded in the Atlanta campaign in June of 1864 and is today actually buried in Chattanooga National Cemetery. Um, but we're going to be kind of following in his footsteps and in the footsteps of of all of these men as they assault the Confederate position here. So this is, I think, my favorite segment of this hike because it's this one spot where I know we're walking where kind of things happen, where I can say we're walking in the route of these groups of people, which I think is kind of cool. Take, we covered, by the, by the time we went up and down, we ran about 600 feet of elevation. How many miles, you say? About four and a quarter, a little over. Just shy of that. Depends on whose uh, who's GPS you're tracking. Well guys, that was the hike. I hope you enjoyed our little trip over to, uh, over to the top of the mountain and back. I am off to go on some more journeys, so until then, 
why don't you go on some journeys of your own? We'll see you next time.